Having a Gas is the podcast that chats to the great and the good of the creative industries. And in particular, finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for cooking to, for dancing to, f***ing to, and more. Today, I'm having a gas with James Brooke Partridge, the head of Moving Image at Ogilvy. Very much the Winston Wolf of production at Sea Containers, James is a straight-talking guy who makes things happen. And after a 10-year stint in Singapore and Hong Kong, James returned to London to take one of advertising's top roles in Moving Image. Hello, James. Hi there. How are we today? We are okay. Uh, I just cycled in. What about you? Have you uh, have you just sauntered through or has it been a, a rough morning already? Well, I'm actually staying at my mum's at the moment because we have a bit of work going on in the house in our place. Uh, so uh, I got up and I walked the dog and then I walked into the... Uh, the conservatory here, which is my office at the moment, so nothing too strenuous so far. Very cool. Yeah, have you found? Are you still working from home? Have you been home the whole time? Uh, we have been working from home since I think about the twentieth of March. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I've been into the office once, which was last week. But, um, but apart from that, it's been yeah, sort of solidly from home the whole time. What was it like? Was it a bit eerie as sea containers? Eerie. Yeah, the whole of London was actually. I was in I was in Soho on Monday last Monday, uh, nine thirty in the morning, and Piccadilly Circus had one pigeon and one man uh, staffing a pop up hand sanitising tent. Um, and it looked like a scene out of 20 day, twenty eight days later. To be honest, with you. yeah, so it's still really quiet in town. No, it is. It is like something out of a dream, isn't it? This year, so. Well, you're based up in Manchester, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, okay. I had three happy years in Manchester, I think. I'm reliably informed I had three happy years at university in Manchester. <laughs> what were you doing there, man? Uh, I read history of all right. things at, uh, at, Owens Park, at Owens University, but I don't know how much work actually got done. No, I mean, that's not the time for working these days, is it? No, it's a great time. The uh, Hacienda was still open there. It was 93 to 96. No Hacienda way. Hacienda was, it was, uh, it was, it was brilliant. I loved it, loved it, loved it. Loved it. Yeah, what was uh, what was what was the journey between history at Manchester and then head of film at Ogilvy? Well, that is an interesting question. I did history at university because I've been good at history at school, and it kind of I enjoyed it, but I kind of realised I wouldn't have to do much work at university because I was using my A level notes to get through years one and two. I think I really only kind of had to study hard in the, in the final year. Um, but my brother did history and my dad was very big on history, so we've been quite strong in that. So I, I just enjoyed it. Um, at university, I kind of I kind of got into that, you know, DJ and kind of dance music kind of stuff. I always wanted to be I always wanted to be a DJ or music producer, but when we came out of university, uh, it, it dawned upon me that I had absolutely zero musical talent. Uh, so, well, some people also, make it all through the industry without realizing that. So, well, yeah, if you read, if you read Kill Your Friends, which is a great book about the A and R industry and that kind of stuff, it's uh, the, the, uh, allegedly written by someone who works in the business. Um, they, they talk about that basically how people kind of went through the music industry in the eighties, having absolutely no, no no idea what they were talking about. But, um, but some of my friends went on to be uh, to be uh, quite successful uh, in in sound or music. But, um, I just didn't uh, it didn't kind of work out. We ended up working live events um, for a couple of years, uh, and then friend of a friend knew someone who was working. knew Bruce McKelvey, who's head of TV at M N C Sarchi. Oh right, um, yeah. I, uh, I ended up working as his, his, his PA back in nineteen ninety eight, I think, and then um, kind of rest is history. We didn't absolutely no career plan whatsoever. Yeah, I can't about that now at the age of 46 going maybe I should have thought about it a bit more but, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing I mean uh, most almost everyone I've spoken to for this thing and in general in the industry uh, had a wonky career path to say the least and uh, obviously I think Ogilvy's the only one that I'm aware of that offer like a, a, a clear like internship for creatives but generally people just fall in through the you know the sideways through the windows you know yeah, it does seem to be like that. I mean, the I don't know whether I don't know if I agree with the internships. I don't, they did they did they do the pipe, which is yes. uh, have done. Um, um, so I guess that that does count. I don't know. Yeah, but it's kind of it is it is kind of a, an industry which kind of collects people, doesn't it? Rather than uh, especially in the, in the in the production side. I mean, the production side of what we do, you you got half of you know. You need, to, you need to be smart, but you don't need to be educated, is what I say. You need to learn a lot of learn, you learn on the job, right? There's nothing I learned at university which has actually been any use to me at all in 
going to be back home for the actual side. I could have gone into doing what I did at the age of 16, probably, and, and probably being uh, 10 years ahead of where I am now, sort of thing. But, um, uh, but, I, but on, I mean, I, it's, it's quite egalitarian like that. I think, you know, if you work hard and, and you, and you, um, and you are, you, you can show a bit of smarts in terms of how you, and you, and, and you anyone can get into it. You don't need a degree or even yeah. any, any qualifications. <clears throat> so is it through being a PA, um, for someone in the film department that you got into the film department? Yeah, well, I was a, I was a production assistant to Bruce, effectively. I mean, in, in the live events thing before, I, I'd been doing, um, I started off in the technical side, which is about the staging of, of car launches or, or um, you know, it was a company called Spectrum, which is now owned by Jack Morton. Um, yeah. But, but it was kind of, so, so big, big... Uh, Big companies would do product launches or big conferences, and we would stage those for them. Uh, and I, I originally worked on the technical side, so helping bring the staging, the lighting, the sound gear, all that kind of, you know, yeah. um, and doing all the back end governs of it. Um, and then they had a, a, a department um, spectrum at the time, which was the video department, who created the video content to go on the screens of these things. So I kind of got into to, to kind of looking at film and thinking about doing sort of video stuff through through that. Um, uh, and then I kind of saw the advertising industry and all met, met um, Bruce, a friend of a friend, and uh, his PA at the time of leaving, he was looking for someone. So I just interviewed and went there, and that's how I, that's how I got into kind of film production. I mean, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say the agency side is really hardcore film production. The agency side is we're the guys that turn up and demand, and demand coffees. Yeah, uh, uh, getting away of everything, we're trying to work hard. Genuinely. Yeah, but that's, uh, I mean, that's how they are in their own environment. So when in, you know, it's not exactly when in Rome, but when playing away. But uh, you said, you know, you were into DJing and were eyeing up a career in music. And so, you know, what got you started on there? When did you get the bug for music? Uh, I, I just enjoyed, uh, it just, it just it, it, Manchester in 92, 92 93 was, uh, was quite an amazing place to be. And a lot of the, you know, I was at school in West London. A lot of my friends went to DJing and that kind of stuff. I went, I went to a place called Latimer in West London, which was a private school. But I, I, that, I mean, it's a very, very good private school now. It wasn't quite what it is now when we were there. I think we, you'd call it a very good state, a state school when we were there. A lot of kind of, um, a lot of kids who were kind of into underground music scene and that kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, it was always around us, but... Um, I got a pair of decks, started DJing a bit. It, uh, it was, it, it really was a pipe dream. But we, we used to, little friends who were into drum and bass and that kind of thing. <laughs> we were quite, quite into it, all, all of that sort of stuff. So it was just fun to do at university rather than actually doing your study, really. Um, uh, so we did all that. Um, you know, one of my friends who was at university is now a very successful sound engineer in, uh, in the film business. I think he's just working on um, the new Top Gun, the, the remake of Top Gun. Oh, right. Um, which which studio is he at? The Twickenham. He walked, right. he walked in here, he walked in here, I met him the other day, and I go, what have you been up to today? He said, oh, we had Tom Cruise in today doing his, doing all his, uh, his, um, his posting sound work. I thought it was quite an interesting way to spend the day. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was, I got other, I mean, I don't know if you're into German bass at all, but but Matrix and Future Brown, Matrix is a year below me at school. So no he's, he, he's a good friend of ours. Um, was lucky enough to hang out and, or to, to know um, Matt Coleman. His MJ Cole was a good friend of ours. You know, so you, we were people around us who actually went on to be very good and, and had very successful careers in the music business. I wasn't one of them. But as <laughs> I said, I kind, of, I kind of didn't really know any about music or how it worked or anything. It was, it was just fun to be around, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, nothing. Um, Nothing ever came of it. I've got it sounds, a of somewhere, I think. It sounds like you all lived in the. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with Peep Show? I, I'm aware of the show. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. There's a that that thread runs through for Jeremy and Superhands trying to be basically like prodigy type, you know, UK electro uh, pioneers, but with no talent. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a bit of Nathan Barley mixed in there as well. I would have thought. Yeah. But, you know, without, without without the cool without the cool kind of. Um, uh, quite Hoxton-y kind of East London she go. Yeah. So was there um was there like a moment early on in life? Was there a record that caught your attention um, and you know you couldn't stop listening to it? Or you know when did that happen? Was it fifteen? Was it was it thirteen? I was quite. I had an older brother, 
Uh, and therefore you get quite influenced by the older brother and what they listen to. And he was heavily into the Beatles. He was uh, big big on uh, U2 at the time. Um, Simple Minds, um, you, know, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. And then there was a lot of hip-hop kicking around. You know, Public Enemy was massive when we were at school. Right? Yeah. You know, you know, it was all, it was all, all the sort of middle-class white kids rebelling by listening to, uh, to, to, to Public Enemy. Which, but, but they were brilliant, right? And you had... JBC force, uh, gangster, people like that. So there was quite a lot of that kicking about. Um, I mean, for me personally, growing up, I, I used to love you too as a kid, still do. Simple Minds are probably one of my favourite bands of all time, still, weirdly. Uh, but, you, but then Happy Mondays, uh, and then Oasis coming out through university as well. We were in yeah. Manchester in 93, and they were just, um, we were in Manchester when they played the main road gig. Uh, yeah. Didn't get in, but you know, it was, um, I mean, that was a real time, wasn't it? I think looking back at it now. Um, the music scene in the in the UK, it, we were quite lucky to live through that. I think, in a way, it was it was quite an amazing time because the, the country was full of optimism in those days. It doesn't feel like that, that now, but um, you had the the end of uh, the Thatcher era, um, eighty nine. There was there was change going on. The, the rise of the of, the, of New Labour, and they. Tony Blair came in in 96, didn't he? But you had this amazing kind of um, wave of optimism sweeping the country at the time. And you had all, these, all this great music coming on. I remember that when Tony Blair came to power, he had uh, invited all the Brit pop people to number yeah. 10. Yeah. Remember that Noel Gallagher shaking hands and hanging around at number 10? It just seems surreal now. But, um, you know, uh, Happy happy Mondays, um, uh Who's the other great one? The Primal Scream, um, yeah. the Charlatans, all these, all these great kind of bands kicking around. And it was, uh, there was some great music kicking about. Um, but yeah, and then Euro 96 happened as well, which kind of, which kind of, there, there was just this, all that, there was, it, culture, it was just a really interesting time for the UK. And I think, I think it's, it, it feels very different than it does at the moment because I think in 96, I think when you're younger, everything's always a bit sort of um, different and, and you know, much more optimistic, I think, in some regards. But they had, uh, it was a great, it was a great decade. The nineties, I think. Yeah, I am. I am envious. You're not the first person I've spoken to for this series who was in Manchester at that time. I'm just glorying in how great a time it was to be young. Was it? That's a Walt Whitman quote, isn't it? To be young was very heaven at that time, or something like that. And they had a film. Oh, that had... The Hacienda was still going, right? You know, so you had you had um, great nights down at the Hacienda. Sankey Soap Home, some great clubs down there, good DJ, a great DJ scene. I mean, Manchester was really, uh, and it probably still is, I mean, I haven't been up to Manchester for a long time since, since but it was, um, and because it's a smaller city than London, right? L- London's great, but it's very spread out, and, yeah. and, you know, and we kind of, so you don't really dip into it in the same way. Manchester, you can jump in a cab or go on a bus and you're, you're, you know, you can get around everywhere pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of, and because you're young and a student, you just go and enjoy it. You, you sort of take it all in. I think in a bit, a bit more. But it was a great, it was a great city to be in. We had a, we had a cracking time up there, um, and it just, yeah, like, like it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a good time. I think for the UK like that. I mean, even even if you went to Liverpool, you went to Leeds, you went to Newcastle, as we did to see friends at other universities. It felt very similar uh, in terms of there was a lot going on. But again, I think part of it was. Um, Part of it is, is, is being 21 and having no real life experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the best. I, I, I'm 27 now and I find myself quite often thinking back about seven years ago and thinking, God, why was I so much more like, you know, why do I have this so much more of a sense of optimism? And the reason is because I didn't know anything. I didn't know, I didn't have bills to pay, didn't have any of that. Yeah, sales targets, etc. <laughs> yeah, he says it, there's a, there's a quote, he said, what, a, what a great thing is youth and how terribly wasted on the young. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, but again, that's part of life, isn't it? I think, uh, so it's, um, I always say to people in my department, if you want, you know, especially the younger guys who, who possibly aren't married and haven't got kids, you know, if you have any desire to go and try something, do it now, you know, before, before, before your life decision tree changes, uh, if you want to go and do stuff, do, do it while you can, you know, and go and experience everything you possibly can while you can. Yeah. Um, because you get older, I think the, the, your, your ability to, I hate the word because everyone uses it, but I think your ability to pivot, um, change direction, becomes um, more complicated. You know? Yes, yes, when you've got more people in tow. Yeah. Or it yeah, affects yeah. more people. It's good, but that could be taken as, a, especially for the younger people, that could be taken as a kind of veiled offer of redundancy. It's like, if you want to do anything else... <laughs> Leave your job. Yeah. I- 
um, yeah, I've got to be careful how you phrase these things. Well, it's all, you know, when people come to you and they want to talk to you about what they should do with their career or advice, or you might, you know, you think, oh, I'm, I'm, maybe I want to go and do this, or, you know, for example, maybe try being in a production company for a while, or maybe go and do something in the post production world or something. You know, I said, well, just, you've got nothing to lose right now. Try it. You know, the, the, the job you're doing now, this job might not always be here, but, you know, the, the job in general will always be there. So, yeah. Um, just think, get experience what you can. Yeah. Assuming you have the skill set that you can go anywhere, uh, that's the kind of thing, like, you, you know, if you can do the job, it's always a job. Uh, producers, producers are fair. Uh, I mean, producers are pretty broad terms, isn't it? I think, um, you know, I think there's an understanding around some of the technical applications that we need to, we need to, we need to know. But what you actually need to know as a producer, I think, is who to call when you have to answer a question. You know, the, the great skill of producing in most of the areas I've seen is the ability to work with people and understand what's going on around you and, and manage egos and, and, and manage, you know, and keep the workflow going. But, you know, my, my great thing is if you, don't, if you don't know the answer, ask somebody who does. Mm. It's generally the way it works, you know, and um, you, you, can pick up, you can pick up most of the stuff you need to know to be a producer or the stuff you need to do to solve the problems in front of you pretty quickly. Um, you know, after that, it's, it's, more, it's, more, it's more soft skills I think you need to kind of be able to manage. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, so that, that's my view. I don't, it's not, you know, it's not, it really isn't rocket science what we do um, at all. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's that, that's how... So I think going, going from being a post-production producer to being a, an agency producer to working in a production company, there's all, all slightly different ways you've got to operate and certain different things you've got to know to a degree. But I think if you, you know, if you're the sort of person who's got the right attitude and, and again, is willing to learn and, and find themselves into it, I think it's, you, you have the skill sets to move around that change. Yeah, because the key question is always, is, does anyone know anyone who can do this? And, you know, obviously the top producers they have all their, you have all your connections and relationships straight off the bat. You have a number of people you can go to. <laughs> yeah, when I spoke to our, uh, um, when I spoke to Sally, you know, one of your execs, uh, she was saying that the lesson as a producer she learned early on in her career was just say yes to everything and then find a way to do it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 people don't like to hear the word no, right? And there are ways of saying no. Um, but I also think if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know, I'll find out. I think what, what people object to more than anything else is people trying to wing it if they don't really know what they're doing. Yes. You know, and, and, and they get found out pretty fast. But I've always said, if you don't know the answer, it's fine not to know the answer. It's fine. Just, you know, as long as you say, look, I don't know, but I'll go and find out. And go and find out. Because I think people appreciate the honesty. Um, you know, you kind of spot people in the business who are winging it. Uh, you know, you get there's certain types who don't know the answers, who pretend to know the answers, and then get angry when you, they get questions about stuff. You know, but I think you know she's absolutely right, Sally. You know, just um, the word the word no isn't much light, so it's, a, it's how you phrase it, and then finding out ways around it. Especially when clients are uh, you know paying paying lots of money, then there's no such word as no usually. So it's difficult. It's increasingly difficult these days. I think just to. Uh, well, I, you know, actually, I think clients generally like like the honesty. They might not like the answer, but they like the honesty, right? And I, and I, and I think that, in my experience with clients, when there have been problems on jobs, if you tackle it head on and you're just straight with them on what's going on, right? I.e., this is not going to work, but we do we do have a couple of ways around it, right? We, which we should talk about. In my experience, and I think this is universally true, all clients are absolutely fine with that. What they don't like is being told things are fine when they're not. Right. You know, I think that's, that's, and I think the way you manage that in my, from my experience is you just need to be honest with people. You know, um, I think that oftentimes when there are situations or problems on jobs, sorry, my dog's panting down here. <laughs> um, when there are situations on jobs or there are issues kicking around on jobs, often it's because the information's coming through secondhand or going through various people to get to you and going back. And when you actually sit in front of the person who's got a problem and you actually understand exactly what their problem is, usually it isn't as much of a problem as people think it is. And oftentimes you've got a solution for it anyway. So uh, so I think that um, getting upstream and being able to speak to clients when there are, there are issues quicker um, is a good thing. But just again, honestly, just be honest, we're not, we're, not, we're not miracle workers. We can't, you know, we can't turn water into wine, but we can generally fix most of the problems we face on productions. Um, as long as everyone's willing to work with each other to find an acceptable solution. Yeah, yeah. And then there's, I mean, there's also competition. 
uh, it comes into the balance as in sometimes, you know, there was a time when we were starting up that we'd get requests like, can you, can you just turn this electronic piece into an orchestral, you know, full arrangement uh, by close of play? And there, there was there was a feeling of, well, if we don't do it, someone else will. So we have to just turn water into wine sometimes. But obviously, given that, if you can do it under immense pressure, then but it can actually be done, then that's fine. But I suppose what you're aiming at is don't say you can do it when you know that you absolutely can't and then just try and cover up the, 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 the cracks. Well, I think that if, if someone says to you, can you, there's always a... There's a difference between saying you can do something and that it can be done properly, right? Yeah. Can something be done? Yeah, it can be done. Should we be doing it is a different conversation, right? And that's actually the harder conversation to be had, right? Because yes. if you say, yeah, I can turn, I can, I can do that orchestral piece in, in, in a day, but you know it's going to sound bad. The client doesn't know that. The client's expecting it to sound exactly like they want it to. Yeah. So, so, so it's about having that conversation and going, um, you know, I always say, I say this all the time, I, I bore myself with it, but in 1969, we put a man on the moon. I'm pretty sure we could do most things you ask us to do. Right? Yes. But, 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 it, but it's, it's a question of what can be done versus what should be done. Um, and I think that we, I think there is an, it, there's an increasing trend, observationally, I would say, um, just to say yes to everything rather than having a proper conversation about what the implications of yes means. And I think that that's, um, you know, I think the industry's got harder, um, I think the power base has shifted from agencies to clients very much so in the last 20 years in my, in my time in the business. I think agencies have been under incredible, incredible pressure financially over the last few years. And I think therefore there's a lot of fear in the system. So I think people saying no to clients is not something which comes easily. Um, I, you know, I, I think that the problem with not having the honest conversation is you end up in a worse place than you might be when you're having that chat. Uh, and, and I think that in the end of the day, you could go and do anything you're asked to do, but you need to explain to people what the risks are. Um, and I think that, that that's a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah, I, I hear this a lot, by the way, um, that, you know, things have transformed enormously since the glory days in the industry. What What's caused that in your view? The business has changed. I mean, you know, th th this is not the business I got into in 1999. And I don't mean that in terms of it's, it is a communications business and, and based around making um, comments for clients uh, to, to go out there. But, you know, when I started in 1999, we made TV, we made radio, we made print. That was it. You know, so the TV departments were, um, you know, where, where the vast majority of the spend went uh, and where the vast majority of the client's marketing budget went. And therefore... Um, there was a huge significance in what we did and it was it was everything, right? You know, in terms of what was going on. Um, the business is very different now. You know, we, we have multiple channels to deal with kids. I mean, my kids, my daughter's daughter was 12. She doesn't watch TV. She just watches YouTube all day long, right? So their, their experience of growing up and their experience of interacting with media is very different from ours when we were yeah. younger. And I struggled, I struggled to get my head around it. I mean, I'm 46, you know, so I'm not exactly, I wouldn't sound old, but... Um, I'm not old, all right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, kind of, uh, it, it, it's just a very different way that stuff gets consumed and clients need to be making more stuff. And uh, it's therefore just a very different world. And I think that, um, that the traditional agencies, I would argue, haven't been the quickest at catching up with that um, in certain respects. Because I think there is a, a desire still to be delivering, you know, the 60-second TV siege, which I get and I understand. Um, but clients need much more than that. So th there's pressure on budgets, there's pressure on schedules, uh, there's pressure on outputs, uh, deliveries, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that goes in the context of um, agencies coming from a world where they were getting paid phenomenal fees and retainers to do stuff, um, to going into a situation where the pressure on the business is very intense, so the money's coming down, negotiations are getting harder, so agencies are making less money. Um, and that, that kind of circular conversation means that you know, you, 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 the pressure, if the pressure, if there's pressure on the business, um, decision making becomes harder because you become more scared about losing, losing, losing clients. So I think there's, I think there's, um, I think there's a, I, I would say observation looking at most big network agencies, there's a lot of fear in the system, and um, that doesn't that doesn't lead to the best decisions being made sometimes. You know, yeah. But the business, it's it's just very different. You know, it's not there's not. Um, the rise of the web and data has, has really changed the questions being asked of the communications we make. Yeah. Really. 
something it's some, a conversation that I find myself having a lot is talking about um, whether the new channels of communication uh, have yet been optimized for the impact of the communication. What, and what I mean by that is a five second YouTube pre-roll. I've not yet seen someone make the argument that that can be used well. I've heard sort of apologist arguments for it like you know well you can make a hero spot a 60 second tvc or something and chop a bit out of it as often no doubt is the case now you're producing a lot more deliverables from a single shoot but i've not yet i i don't i i like your way of thinking and it's actually something i also say when you say we got to the moon in 69 with a pocket calculator so we can do this the good five second pre-roll is probably a problem that can be cracked but yeah, I don't hear anyone speaking out for it creatively. I think everyone wants to be in the world that you described. It's it's, it's interesting because I think that the I think to make the best five second pre rolls, you need to make five second pre rolls, right? Uh, rather than just cut them out of the main sixty second work. And I think I think this is part of the problem we face is we haven't really heroed the um, we haven't heard the ideas going into the into the actual medium with fit trying to fix. I think it's kind of what you said before, right? So if you've got a five second, if you've got a five second pre-roll, you need to write five second ideas. Not just hope you're going to get it in a way which really works out of 60, because it feels like an afterthought. And I, I think we've been guilty of that too much, really not really working out how to explain stuff out until your digital media just doing what, you know, one big campaign idea, great, and one big 60 second TVC. But but what does that really look like in the in the in the other formats? Um, I saw a talk at Cannes last year, the year before, who was Andrew Robertson. I think he was he was talking about how, you know, if I, we possibly come at it from the wrong way. We think about cutting down a 60-second TVC rather than maybe taking a print ad and making a print ad a bit more interesting as a five-second visual, right? Yes. You know, because, because, because you know, billboards have been catching people's attention. If someone's attention span is three seconds or four seconds, print ads have been doing it for years on the side of motorways. You know, so if you think about it in that sense, it's it, it, it's it's just a complete different uh, different way of thinking about it. We've we've been here before, right? Yeah. Um, uh, your billboards on the side of motorways, people driving in cars, they're going to they're going to go past this billboard, they're going to have five seconds to see it. What are you going to say to them? And I, I don't think that's any different from a pre-roll. Except of course, in the pre-roll, you can skip it if it's if it's skippable or whatever. Um, but I, I don't see. I, I don't think. I don't think I've seen situations often enough, and we do get them, but not often enough, where the whole thinking towards all the deliverables is done, or given it, the thinking behind each deliverable is given the same weight, is what yeah. I would say. Um, and, and, and I think that is, when, when, when the digital media spend is becoming more important than the TV spend, which it is, I, I believe, I mean, I, I think the numbers on online spending uh, have gone up dramatically, even in the last... Months, but I think I think it's overtaking TV spend. I could be wrong. Yeah, Tom um, Roger, Adam and Eve poster an analytic the other day that goes, you know, digital goes like that, and all the other ones drop off. Like they all take a small hit, but they all contribute to that hit, you know, of digital budget. So if that's the case, and that's the audience we're speaking to, and we have, we have to get behind it, then that then that's just the reality of the situation. It doesn't. It's, it is. It, so we need we need to be thinking more like that. Um. So yeah, who knows? Yeah, I think creatively. Uh, whatever it is, something we've been talking about a lot, and I spoke to Sean Thompson about this. Who, what, why? Uh, we and he makes you know their, their team and everyone at Wyden, frankly, from when they were at Wyden, make really great stuff. They make really entertaining uh, pieces. I was showing a DOP the GIF GAF advert that they made, and saying you would just watch that for the sake of it because it's a great bit of film. I think creatively, it's a case of what you said. You, you know, don't give all of your TLC to the 60 second spot because what most people are seeing is the five seconders or what, you know, the Instagram stuff. And I think people still want to see engaging and entertaining content because the format is much more, I think, irritating to people because, you know, having a small amount of advertising twice before the YouTube thing you've gone for, you know, people kind of feel like they're swatting flies away. And so, if they're at least grateful for what they've seen, if it's good film, then, you know, that should be the focus, I think, anyway. Well, pe people like to be entertained, right? Yeah. I think that is true. I mean, I, I, we, we, can, we, can wish that, we can wish the pre-rolls away if we want, but they're not going anywhere. So I think you've, you, you've either got to um, kind of accept that and get on with it, or um, your career for the next 20 years is going to be pretty disappointing in terms of, in terms of what you'd say. I mean, I, I, kind of, I kind of, you know, is it, is it the industry I envisioned when I started in 99? No, it's not. 
um, are, you know, you can look at all the great work we did back in the, you know, the 80s and 90s and go, uh, it would be great to be making as many, as many good ads as, as that as we, now as we did then. Um, but I'd, I'd rather be on the front of the wave looking forward, thinking about what we can do rather than standing in the back of it talking about the good old days all the time because it's frankly boring, right? Yeah. You know, I, and it's funny, in, 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 I, in 1999, I worked at MNC Sarge, you know, there was a guy there called Fergus Fleming who was brilliant, absolutely brilliant creative director. But you spoke to him in 1999 and he said the world was coming to an end in advertising anyway. So I think this conversation's been going on for, for the whole of time. I imagine the guys in the early 90s who'd come, who'd come through the 80s said, oh, the 90s are terrible. I imagine the guys in the early 80s who'd been through the 70s said, oh, the 80s is nothing like the 70s. I just kind of think that everyone hankers back to the days when they were, when they were doing the, the, what they deemed to be the best stuff. I also think that even in, even in times when we were making great advertising, we were also making a lot of rubbish, right? So I, I think that, I, I think that um, memory can be a bit selective. Yeah. And I just, it, life gets a bit boring when we do is talk about the good old days, right? It, we, we've got to try to make these days the best we can by, by making the best work we can. It's not easy. Um, and I don't think that the work is, you know, arguably, you can sit on that argument for hours about you know, the relative qualities of the work at any particular time. There's still some great stuff coming out, um, uh, but I don't know whether I don't know whether some of you know we we, hank, we hanker back over some mediums which might definitely be falling to a wayside. But I, I, but I think there's still opportunities there. I think you're right. I mean, you, you want you want to make those those moments of engagement and keep for, for consumers to be moments they want to stay with rather than go away from. And if they're looking at a six second bumper, well, let's make that six second bumper as good as we can. Yeah. Um, yeah. My- and I never thought about that as well. You know, when you were talking about the, the propensity towards nostalgia, I think that's the right mm-hmm. way of saying it. Um, things were better. Of course, you know, I always, I, I, I'm sure if anyone listens to more than one of these, they'll get bored of me referring to mad men, but 60s TV department wasn't a thing in agencies. It's like, you know, and so there would have been a, oh, if only we could just get back to the glory days of just doing print. And, uh, well, well, I think yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, fair point. I mean, I, I, and I think it's kind of, um, yeah, you, you, you hear a lot of it. Um, and I get it. I just kind of think that we, if, we spend, if you spend all your time with your head in the past, you don't work out what your future looks like. And, it, and it's not, it's not, I, I don't find it personally, I don't find it good for me personally to be looking back all the time. Um, I'm quite nostalgic anyway. And quite, yeah. uh, you know, uh, so to actually sort of, sort of reside there, it, it's not, it's not a good place for me to be. I need to believe that, um, you know, I, I need to believe that we are still able to do interesting stuff and, and, and at least look forward and try to try the best of what we've got. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, yes, a great forward facing attitude. So, um, What's the plan for the rest of the year? Is there, is there any talk of getting back into uh, the office or getting back amongst people? The, I, I think that the, I, I, I didn't think we would be back in the office uh, before Christmas, but I think we will. Um, I think there's a, there are moves afoot to, to open up um, the Ogilvy office uh, in sea containers, I think uh, September sometime, soft launching. I think there's massive issues with getting large numbers of people into the office because of social distancing. I also think there's a big question mark about transport in and out of town. Yeah. I mean, um, I think the you know the reality is that operate companies have been operating pretty well for four months, not being in the offices. So I think moving forward, there's a big conversation around how much do you actually need to be in the office to get your job done. Yeah. Um, uh, working from home, I think also companies will massively reevaluate their office space, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're Two big overheads of salaries and office space, and you've just been you've been operating for four months and using office space. Why would you want to keep out those kind of overheads? Really? So I got I got a feeling that there's, there's quite a lot there's quite a lot of change coming in that sense. But I think we will be those. I think there will be the ability to go back to the office for those who need and want to. Um, September sometime, I think. Yeah. I'm hearing. You uh, you studied history, and so for the benefit of future historians. Uh, what do you make of what's going on this very minute? So basically where we're at in history is the beginning of the COVID economic backlash. The redundancies have been huge over the last three weeks. What do you make of what's going on? It's a very dangerous time, I think. Uh, I think that if you, look, if you look through history, economic downturn always leads to political extremism, right? And the classic is, is the rise of the Nazi party back after, after the Great Depression, right? People forget. We've seen, we, we, we've seen, we've seen a... a, a, a and, uh, and some of that with, with the financial crisis of 2008 and the rise of Trump, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, you know, and not the rise, but the fact that people tend to flock to, to the extremes. Yes. Um, 
you know, I, as, as a student of history, what I would say to, to everybody is be, be reminded of what's happened in the past. I don't think it can't happen again. Yeah. You know, I, I, we, we, we are, um, I think we're in quite a, a, a difficult time for, for society and civilization as a whole, uh, because I think that we are going to go through a very deep recession on the back of this. Uh, and even if we manage to stay off the worst sides of the deep recession, we, we think the, the, the government debt is huge. Taxes are going to have to go up. You know, all it, it's going to be a lot of um, things are going to happen which weren't on the agenda in the beginning of this year. Um, you know, so it, it's a cliche, isn't it? But I think that um, I, I think what it was, what I would say is everyone just needs to look out for each other. Be reminded things are going to be difficult. Look look after your fellow man. Be kind to each other, uh, and 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 try and help as much as possible. But um, we shall see. Uh, you know, I don't I don't. It's, it's highly probable that Donald Trump is back in the U.S. again, um, and his brand of politics, uh, whether you agree with it or not, is certainly divisive at best. Um, uh, which I'm not sure is necessarily the best way for the, for the planet to be heading, given the, given the challenges we face. But um, we shall see. We yeah, shall see. it's definitely an interesting time um, to be recording and talking about this stuff, I guess. But um, but yeah, um, so back to uh, the the musical side of things, um, and we'll give it a bit of a steer in that direction. I was interested to know because I often see you. Uh, uh, what would you say? Phrasing and you know commenting on stuff and saying who's done good work. You've obviously got an eye on what's going on in the industry, but in general, what's the best uh, music in an advert that you comes to mind for you? Synced or composed doesn't matter. What you know, what 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 comes to mind? You know, the other one that instantly springs to mind, which everyone will hate, and, um, it's a Galaxy ad, which is that almost like the TikTok spot we did, um, yeah. but it's. Uh, it's a catchy little song that's being composed about um, uh, long-lasting battery life, is the way it ends. It's not. It's not anything other than a bit of fun, really, or a bit of a, a bit of track. I always watch that, and it just it just, it just amuses me, uh, and it makes me watch it. And I think you know, with, with that, with that sort of just catching the eyes, interesting, getting that. Um, the music tracks I've been done in the ads recently. I mean, I thought the, um, the Snoop Dogg stuff for Uber Eats was fantastic, right? You know, um, and, 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 and that was brilliantly written and well executed. And again, proof that there's still great work getting made, right? Yes. Uh, people, they want a celebrity endorsement. I thought it was done brilliantly and, and crafted and shot brilliantly. I think the work on three that Ian Pond's Jules done recently has been fantastic as well. Um, uh, uh, and then going back a bit longer than that, Night London, I thought was brilliant, you know, uh, and the use of music in that was fantastic. You know, there's, there's still a lot of, um, there's still enough out there to make one believe that, uh, that there's great opportunities to do good work. I think it's very difficult. Uh, it is hard. It's always been hard to get good work done, right? You know, because often it's, challenge, it's challenging uh, everybody to go to areas where they don't feel comfortable. And I think if you if you don't feel comfortable with what you're being asked, it's, you've probably got an interesting conversation going on, right? If you feel comfortable, it's probably going to be the same stuff we've always been making. Yeah. You know, so, so I think you need to be, to make stuff which really pushes the boundaries and really excites, I think you have to be, feel a bit nervous about stuff. Um, but yeah, I think those, those, are the, those are the spots that, that immediately spring to me. And of course, you've got all the... Um, uh, the Libras, the Evolver stuff, which is which is which has been incredible in terms of shifting a uh, shifting the conversation on an area which has traditionally been taboo. You know, Wim Stories has just come out, which again I thought was well again spits opinion interestingly among, amongst everybody, but gets people talking, uh, and I thought was beautifully crafted. Um, so you know, there's there's uh, there's some good pieces, bits and pieces out there. Yeah, uh, what's the best? thing that you've ever put forward to a client where you've said this is the track uh, and they were not having it uh, God. there's probably been loads but I can't think of it at the top of my mind I think that the we, we did a, we, we, we were lucky enough to redo Heroes by David Barry for Wannadoo many years ago Wannadoo bought the track so it actually came to us um, and that was fun I did uh, I worked on British Airways a lot when I was younger, so we recording LACMO loads of different kind of orchestral arrangements, which is great. I did my first ever big job as a producer. It was a 50-piece orchestra at Abbey Road Studios. And that Amazing. Was, um, which was which was which was which was, which was incredible. And, and when you when, when you um, I didn't realise at the time how significant that was in my career. In a sense, like have I ever done it since? No. You know, but to be standing in Abbey Road Studio Number One, you know, with a, with a full orchestra, with the history of that place was pretty was in, was uh, was incredible. Um, 
in terms of big big pieces of music, it, there have been a few. I can't remember off the top of my head, honestly. We, but um, I have been lucky enough to do the full, the full orchestral thing, thing a couple of times, which I think is, when you actually sit in a room with the full, the full orchestra playing around you, Yes. You actually feel it here. It hits you here. It's like wow. It's, it's just. It's just. It's. I did. We re, we redid the Bond theme music actually as well for Bond promo for, with, with the full orchestra as well. I when was that? Town. That would have been for Casino Royale. Brilliant. So into into mid two thousands, but what for Town Hall? When they just hit the, when when the strings come in at the beginning of that again, it's just. It's incredible when you when you hear music in certain in certain situations and it. it, it you feel the wave of music actually hit you. It's a, it's a physical experience as well as an audio one, right? It's quite incredible. Yeah, there's a number of people um, who have been to Abbey Road who I've spoken to for this. Uh, and yeah, everyone says that's the best day of my career when I went to do that. Uh, James Cross, BBC Creative, when they did the, the 2018 World Cup thing, he said, I oh, just going to sit in Abbey Road. Uh, was the best thing. But that reminds me of something that Sally was talking about. I want your take on, because we were talking about drawing things back as a result of COVID-19. Um, and Sally talked a lot about how shoots are going to change after this. And in the same way we found we don't need as much office space, we found that there are people we can do without on the shoots. What what have you, what, or what do you predict in that way? I think that, I think that in the short term, shoots is going to become more complicated as you'll need more people. Um, or more time, right? Um, I think that the remote shooting is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid, going to become much more prevalent. Um, we're seeing it on a job we've got on the go at the moment. We had wanted to go to shoot a job in a certain place, but that place has become slightly more difficult to get into. But we can still shoot there. So it's going to become, it was meant to be half remote with a couple of people going. It's probably going to be full remote now. Um, there is no doubt that uh, this is going to change how we operate. I think that, um, in terms of number of people on set, I don't, I, I, I don't know about that or, or particular roles. I'm not sure that that will the roles will disappear. Um, but I think that uh, you know there's two big pushes up. There's a big push around sustainability in the business anyway, right? Before we go into the whole COVID piece, and there's a, there's a stat which I can't remember, but it's quite large. And one of the biggest. Um, negative effects on the carbon emissions from the advertising business of people travelling on planes to shoots, or specifically around production. Um, if you if you cut the number of people flying to shoots, then you're ticking a massive sustainability box, which is a big thing these days for, for uh, organisations. Um, and if that is being driven by the fact you have to do that running through COVID, therefore the technology around remote shoots is getting, is getting better for a health and safety reason, then that would, seems to me to be something which is going to become more permanent for us. Um, you know, I think what COVID's done is, is it's drastically um, sped up some of the technical innovations that were already in the system, which people could ignore because they didn't really want to. Um, you know, I think there's going to be probably quite a big upsurge in green screen technology around um, uh, virtual sets. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the making of The Mandalorian, um, which was shot. It was all, a lot of it was shot with virtual CG sets on LED screens, and you can change the set. So you can shoot at five or six different locations on one set in a day. Or you can shoot a 10 hour dawn, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it, it gives a lot of flexibility of how you might be able to set shoots up um, without having to move people around so much or without having the cost of construction and this kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's innovations in the system which are going to become more prevalent because they feed into the challenges we're facing at the moment that have been brought about by COVID. And that's no bad thing. Um, I think change, you know, I, I, I do say about the advertising agents, advertising business, we're one of the most reactionary organisations in the world. We don't change very fast. We don't like it particularly. We, get, we always encourage our clients to do it. We don't really like it very much. Um, so if you have those opportunities and go, well, it, might, it won't be as good as shooting it, so you've got to keep pushing away. We can shoot, we can shoot it where we've always done it. But actually now I think there's innovation coming through which we have to embrace more fully because the ability to say no to stuff um, and not quite go about it the way you might have wanted to is is changing. It's changing for a reason which is out of all of our control, which was COVID, really. So I think, you know, I, I'd encourage everyone to lean into those, those things and, and, and look at them properly and really try and test them out and see. Um... So, but in, ter in terms of roles, who knows? I mean, it, the film business hasn't changed a huge amount in terms of roles and responsibilities re really over the part, over, over, since the whole time I've been in it and before that. You know, innovations in tech around editing and, and, and post-production obviously have become... Um, they, 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 the, the processes have changed, but the, the people needed to do it 
um, hasn't hasn't changed huge. I mean, they have leg cutters anymore, obviously, but you, you have a lot. Of the editors still exist. They just they just use different kit. Um, so I think it's it, it's it is an interesting time. I think the technology piece will change. I think the way we go about things will change. But I think there's still going to be a lot of people wanting to make creative output, right? You know, yeah. and you used to look at you know, the rise of Netflix and the studios like that, where they're really churning stuff out. So it's, I don't think, I'm, you know, I'm sure other people have a different opinion on this, but I think as a, as a writer director, there's probably never been a better time to be around than now. Why? Um, why do you think that? Because of the amount of content all these all places like Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime, Apple, they all need content. They're, they're, they are paying to have stuff shot, original programming made again. Um, so the, the opportunity to get stuff made and, and get your idea on screen um, it probably has never been greater. Yeah. The amount of stuff, liberation of stuff, you know, the studio system in the UK, um, they, they just announced they're building another studio in East End. I don't know if you saw that. Um, yeah. Down by Agnew. Um it's very, it's very difficult to get even with Twickenham Studios where they're being re- refitted and redone. Right, um, that the, the studios are full because Netflix and the likes are taking out leases on all the studio spaces for X amount of wow. years because there's yeah. so much studio program, programming coming up. So, I think there's, I, th- I think in terms of content, using the content to, 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 to cover. All the mediums to get made, you know, for, for entertainment purposes as well. I think directors have got the opportunity. If you've got an idea and it's half decent, uh, and, and you can go and sell it to, us, to, to someone like Netflix, some of like that, there's a good chance they'll pay you to make it <laughs> at the moment, right? Which wasn't the case five, ten years ago. So you're saying that five, ten years ago, there was the entertainment industry, as such, was a pretty closed shop, and yeah. You had, you had the big the big studios making the big feature films, which was quite hard to get into. So like yeah. Warner, Universal, Sony, you've got it locked down. Yeah, I think they, they, they did, you know, they all, and, and you had to be a big name producer doing stuff to, to get the stuff through then. Um, whereas the film, really the film business, the, the, the Hollywood film business seems to be under a lot more pressure now because of the rise of these other entertainment channels like that. Um, yeah, I just think it, there's lots of people shooting lots of stuff, right? So I think I think filming is strong at the moment, you know? You know, yeah, I never thought about that until now. So yesterday we were talking to a guy, formerly Ministry of Sound, and we're talking about how to explore a problem in music, which is, it's you know, the the it's hard to make any money from selling music anymore. You know, you have to do live, and now COVID has put the brakes on live. Um, and obviously the three major labels, again, Warner, Universal, Sony, have big stakes in the streaming services like Spotify, and so they can uh, presumably negotiate favourable deals. But, that, you know, it just occurred to me that, well, any business is going to try and sh- shore up their assets elsewhere if assets somewhere else in the business are becoming more precarious. And I never thought that perhaps the film industry shifting towards these digital content providers like Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and away from the studios is causing them to react in different areas, like in the music world, and try and put the brakes on there and, and try and you know become more dominant. I don't know. Uh, you know, business businesses always react to try and protect themselves, don't they? I mean, Disney's interesting because they've got a Disney Channel now, and they are they're, you know they've got all their content sitting there, um, and they're pumping new stuff out. The Mandalorian is interesting as a as a as an series based on, I mean, it's based on the Star Wars saga, but yeah, all new stuff being shot. But yeah, I'm mean, looking. It's, it's interesting times. I'm going to have to dash. I'm afraid I've got another another call to get on to. Um, okay. I've just noticed. But um, interesting, ca- interesting chat. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, well, thanks for taking the time on a, of a Friday morning, and I look forward to speaking again soon. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers now. Bye.